Welcome to this uh, afternoon session. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Elad B. Tatmore from uh, Aerospace uh, University of uh, uh, Minnesota. Thank you. <laughs> I knew he was somewhere. So my first recollection of uh, Elad was uh, 1991. Uh, Brown, when he came from Haifa, he had just graduated with a BS in uh, mechanical engineering from the Technion. And he joined the PhD program at, at Brown University. I have to say that it was a fantastic time. Uh, I think we all look back to that time with uh, great nostalgia. There was a never-ending string of uh, really brilliant students that went through. Uh, so I had the privilege at the time to work with Alad, uh, with uh, Rob Phillips, and it was really, really a great time. Uh, and so at some point he had to graduate and he moved to uh, Harvard and worked with uh, Tim Kaxiras. So if you want to learn about first principles in quantum mechanics, y you cannot do any better. Okay, so I'm sure those were very formative years also for him, his time at Harvard. And then he decided to go back to his uh, alma mater and he took a position in mechanical engineering, uh, Haifa, the Technion, beautiful Haifa, and uh, went through the ranks until 2006. Uh, and at that time, he came back to Minnesota and took a position of a professor in uh, aerospace, uh, engineering and mechanics, and he's been there ever since. So, of course, he has, Elad has a fantastic record of accomplishment to uh, his name. All you need to know is that Elad is a deep thinker, and he's always up to something devilishly clever and interesting. And... Uh, that way, by force of reason, he pushes the field forward. And the other thing I really enjoy of Elad is that I always learn something from his talks, which by the time you get to be uh, my age, it becomes increasingly rare. And uh, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, his presentation. I'm sure it won't be uh, any exception. Elad, please. All right, thank you. Of course, there's no pressure now. I have to teach Michael Ortiz something. That's going to be fun. Not easy. All right. So uh, well, I guess I have to stay next to this. OK, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. And thank you for coming to the talk. Um, what I'll tell you about today is work that was done as part of a MURI project. It's in, funded by the Army on 2D materials, in particular 2D heterostructures, which are stacked 2D materials. That's a project I've been involved in for about four or five years now, five years, and I'll tell you a little bit of what, what I've learned in that process. Um, the work I'll be talking about today was done by the people that you see listed under participants, Ming Jen Wen, who was uh, closer to this. Ming Jen Wen, who was uh, uh, one of my graduate students who's now at LBL, just started this week actually, or will be starting next week, I guess, and uh, Quan Zhang, who was a postdoc. Um, all right, so let's just start with a, just putting a picture of a 2D material on the screen. Everybody, I'm sure, has heard of graphene. Uh, it's a two-dimensional sheet of carbon atoms. Uh, it was interestingly postulated theoretically to be impossible originally, but it turns out that it's not impossible. And in fact, a Nobel Prize was given in 2005 for discovering that you can't have stable graphene. Uh, and it was done really easily with scotch tape, you may have heard. Take a piece of scotch tape, you peel off a layer, get rid of the scotch tape, and voila, you have graphene. So since then, many, many other 2D materials have been discovered. Uh, I don't know the exact number because it keeps changing. Um, but there was a recent theoretical paper using the DFT that estimates that there are 6,000 stable 2D materials. So it's a huge um, menagerie of 2D materials out there. Uh, I should maybe explain that a 2D material is basically a crystalline material that has one unit cell in one direction. So it's not often exactly 2D materials. It can have multiple layers, but the unit cell, there's only one. So now these 2D materials are divided into many different, you are, they have many different behaviors, conductors, insulators, semiconductors, magnetic, superconducting. Uh, you, you find them in all categories. So now the, the next step, okay, these are already interesting in their own right, but, but the next step is that you can stack these things. And that's what sometimes gets called 2D heterostructures. 
The idea is that you take one 2D material and you put another one on top of it, and then maybe another one. And um, it, the properties of these materials are very sensitive to which materials you stack and the relative orientation, if you twist them but relative to each other, changes their properties. So you can see that if you have 6,000 materials and then you have all these different ways of stacking them and twisting them, that's really an infinity of possibilities that, uh, to deal with. Uh, now, they're characterized, these uh, heterostructures, by having strong inter, uh, intralayer bonding inside of the layer and weak interlayer, right, the, which is van der Waals type bonding. Now, as I said, the, the properties of these things are very sensitive to orientation, and a beautiful example was just recently discovered last year um, that if you take graphene, two layers of graphene, and you twist them by about 1.1 degrees, it turns from a conductor into a superconductor, simply by rotate, rotating by one degree. Uh, and that was work that was done by Tim Caxiris that uh, Michael mentioned in the talk, my postdoc advisor. He's also on this MURI that I'm on, and that was one of the exciting things that happened during the MURI. So now mechanics, where I'm a mechanics person. Uh, to be honest, most of the interesting properties of these things are quantum, optical, electrical, magnetic, uh, they also have very interesting mechanical properties, but they're often not the primary interest. However, mechanics plays an important, a critical role, really, because these things deform, you, you can imagine, a, a, a one, you know, a, a sheet of atoms, one atom thick. You just have to look at it and it bends, uh, let alone touch it. And so these things are wrinkled, completely wrinkled. Uh, they have all sorts of interesting features, waves, you know, vibrations, and so on, that strongly affect everything else, the electronic, the magnetic, the optical properties. You really can't do anything if you don't understand the mechanics. Um, a second thing is that they also happen to have extremely good mechanical properties. They're ultra strong, and so people are looking at using them for composites. You can put graphene, for example, into epoxy, and you can make composites. And I have a project on that. I won't talk about that, but uh, it turns out to have some really interesting properties. Okay, so what we were doing in the project, our task was to develop atomistic and multi-scale, atomistic and multi-scale computational methods to simulate these things. And we did several different uh, things in order to do that. The, the first one was we developed interatomic potentials for these systems in order to be able to simulate them at the atomic level. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that today, or about half my talk will be about that, not a little bit. Um, and then we developed this kind of multi-scale continuum atomistic framework to model layers of, of, uh, of 2D materials, heterostructures. And I'll talk about that. And then the third thing we've been working on is molecular dynamics and statistical mechanics of, of, uh, of these thin materials and understanding their thermal properties. Uh, um, and in the, the statistical mechanics side of it is interesting. But I won't talk about that either. So I'll talk about the first two topics. So to set the stage, to have something to talk about, we'll, we'll focus on graphene. It's the simplest material to sort of un get your head around if you're not familiar with other materials, although we've looked at others as well. Um, and in particular, we look at these bilayers, graphene bilayers. And so that just means you take one layer of graphene, which looks like what you see as top view on the bottom left there. It's, it's like chicken wire, basically, with the, the vertices being carbon atoms. Um, but, and if you put two on top of each other, there are two different ways that they like to stack. One is the is so-called AA stacking, where the two layers are right on top of each other, and one where they're sort of uh, shifted, one relative to the other, and that's called AB stacking. And there's two uh, symmetry-related stackings of the AB type. Where they're called AB and BA. It's just like twins of each other, basically. Um, there's also another stacking called SP stacking that we'll, we'll see later. Now, AA and AB are, are, the AA stacking is actually the high energy stacking, it's actually unstable, uh, and AB is low energy stacking, okay? So you wanna remember that. So here's a problem to kind of motivate it. This was one of the problems that motivated us early on. If you take the two layers and you twist them by some amount, um, and then you do a dark field TEM image, you see the pattern that you see on the bottom right, this sort of triangular gray, black, gray uh, uh, triangles. Uh, and they were identified as related to this ABBA type stackings that I mentioned before. So it's sort of like a twin configuration that's formed. And we were kind of interested, how do you get from twisting by layer, graphene by layer to that pattern? And so I'll, by the end of this talk, you should understand that. 
But before you can model anything, you need to have good, before you can do simulations, you need good models. And so the first thing that we did was to look at interatomic potentials. And so I'll, let me tell you a little bit about that side of it because it's sort of interesting. Um, so probably everybody knows about potentials, but let me just give you uh, like the two slide background. The real world, we think, is described by quantum mechanics. At least it's a good model for the real world. Uh, and in that setting, if you look at graphene, you have this type of uh, pattern where the, the colors represent charge densities. And so you could solve this with first principles. It's very expensive. And so we want more approximate models so that we can look at larger systems. The, the, the doorway to that is the so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation. It says that under normal, normal if, 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 if the loading is slow enough, then what happens is the electrons always have time to find their ground state. Therefore, you don't have to explicitly simulate them, and it's just sufficient to only look at the, um, at the nuclei. And the electrons are represented through some effective model of the nuclei. And so then uh, the, the job of creating a potential is to come up with some functional form that takes as input the positions of the atoms, say carbon atoms. And now you have additional parameters in the model, and those parameters are meant to represent the electrons that you've thrown out. And it depends how you construct your, your functional form to know what these alpha parameters are. They can be fitting parameters. They can be hyperparameters. In a machine learning model, it depends what your model is. Uh, and then what you basically do is you do, you, you uh, can I reach here? No, I can't even, okay, never mind. I'll have to describe what I'm pointing at. So between the potential and the, uh, the way you get these parameters or hyperparameters is that you have a training set, a training set of DFT data, quantum data, or experimental data, and then you optimize the choice of parameters to best represent that. And what that means depends on what you're doing. You know? So if you want to do this for a 2D heterostructure like a graphene bilayer, it's kind of tricky because there's various types of bonding that are, operate on very different scales. And so within the layers, you have these very strong sigma bonds, uh, covalent bonds between the carbon atoms that you can see marked there. Uh, but then there are also these pi bonds that stick out, and uh, or pi orbitals, and these these uh, orbitals, they they interact with each other. You can imagine that if I try and move the two layers relative to each other, these orbitals will overlap and begin to repel, and so there's a repulsion that comes from that, which is actually the source of friction between these systems, and there's also van der Waals interactions, and so you have to model all of that to get things correctly. So you can do this in two different ways, which I call physics-based or machine learning. So a physics-based model would be one where you try and write down a functional form that has some physics or geometry baked into it that you're trying to represent. You understand a covalent bond and you create some model that tries to capture that. Uh, a machine learning model is one where you basically just have a training set of data and you interpolate that data. You learn from the data, but essentially you're interpolating the training set. Um, and so we, there are advantages and disadvantages to these methods, right? So if, if we look at various categories and compare them, in terms of accuracy, machine learning tends to win out as long as you operate within the training set. Then they're fitted or they're interpolating quantum data, and so they can be quite good if, if they work. Um, on the other hand, physics-based models have more transferability. In other words, if you fit them to some set of data, you have a hope of representing something that's far from your training set, because you've got some physics. A machine learning model has no physics, so it can never do that. Um, computational time is a big advantage for, the, for these uh, physics-based models. They're significantly faster, even than machine learning, not to mention uh, DFT. Um, the physics, where does it live? So in a physics-based model, it lives in the functional form. In a machine learning model, it lives in the training set. Uh, number of parameters is a difference. Physics-based models, tens, maybe hundreds, if it's something like Reacts or an expensive potential like that. Machine learning, very, very large number, 10,000 plus, plus, plus. You need very dense training sets to, for that to work. Uh, so I say training sets very large. Uh, now here's kind of where it supposedly is an advantage for machine learning, another advantage, and that's when you have a new system, right? And so if you want to make a new physics-based model for a new system, that's a lot of work. We're talking a year or two of work, typically, to come up with a good form for a completely new system that you've never seen. Um, machine learning, in principle, is more straightforward because it's a universal approximator. So you have to do it, but the sort of things you're doing are always sort of similar. And so if you've developed good methods for it, it's, it's, it works. But don't let anybody sell you <laughs> 
You know, it, it's, it takes a lot of time, and it's annoying time. Whereas in the case of the physics, when you're thinking about physics, which is fun, machine learning, you're dealing with, oh, okay, do I have enough parameters? And it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not that much fun. Okay, so let's move on. So, oh, I should just say that we, we've done both of these things. You know, we've done machine, physics-based models for various systems. We've done machine learning models. So we have sort of experience comparing between them. I'll talk more about the machine learning stuff here because uh, the physics, just because I don't have enough time, not, not because it's better. So what's a machine learning method? It, it's, a machi it's a method where a computer tries to, has the ability or tries to learn from data without being explicitly programmed to understand the underlying physics or whatever phenomena it's trying to understand. Like it doesn't have to understand what a cat is or a dog is in terms of some kind of a physical model. You simply give it a ton of pictures of cats, a ton of pictures of dogs, and it just learns, right? And it learns by creating kind of like the human brain learns. There's in a neural network model, for example, there's a series of layers of neurons, and the connections between these neurons are created until it makes the best matches with the labeled data that has been given, right? That's a machine learning model. And then once you've trained it enough, then you give it something new, and assuming everything works well, it'll spit out cat when you give it a cat or a dog when you give it a dog. Um, so now for, we want to use this for an interatomic potential. So there our objective is we have an atom and we have its environment, and what we want to spit out is the energy of that atom. So we want to create a machine learning model that will take its input, the configuration of atoms around an atom, and give its output the energy of that atom. And once we have that, if we sum, we run this model n times for n atoms, we get the total potential energy of the system. So it's a per atom model that we're using. So the first step is you've got you to turn that, in, that in neighborhood of the atom into an input into the neural network potential. And I'll talk about that in a second. Actually, most of the art lives there. Uh, but once you have some representation of the environment, you feed it through your neural network. Um, and what happens is you have a bunch of layers, as I said. Each layer has a bunch of nodes. And to go from one layer to the next is a very simple mapping, actually. It, you see it written on the bottom. It's a linear mapping. So the y, say y1's, the first column here, y1, y, um, that has a subscript one, that first layer is a linear operation over the previous layer. So that's w plus times y0 plus some bias, which a bias is just a number that you add, OK? And then you apply a nonlinear activation function to it, like that arctan you see on the left, and that turns the neuron on or off based on its value. Okay, that's the whole thing. Uh, now, the thing is that there are a lot of parameters here, right? Because what you have is all the weights, W, and all the biases. Um, and so you basically, the training process is to pick those numbers that best reproduce the input that you get. Okay, so now the input layer to the neural network you don't want to give it absolute atom positions because then the neural network is going to have to learn that an atomic energy is rotationally, translationally invariant, permutation invariant, inversion symmetry invariant. You're going to spend all your time teaching it invariances that you know, right? Not going to be a smart way to, to use your, your, your learning time. And so the, the better way to do it is to create a set of descriptors that are already invariant with respect to all of these. So you want to turn that set of 3n positions in the neighborhood of atom alpha into some set of numbers that characterize that environment that, are, that have all these invariances. So if I rotate or translate, these numbers don't change. And there's a whole industry out there to create descriptors. Uh, these are called descriptors uh, that characterize the environment. They're, they're called uh, symmetry functions, moment and expansion, SOAP is another one. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and as I said, the success of a neural network potential depends on how good your descriptors are. If you have enough, if it's a good representation, and so on. And it's a computational bottleneck. In a neural network potential, that takes up to as much as 90% of the time is just constructing the descriptors. The operation, the neural network is cheap. It's just a bunch of linear mappings, right? So very cheap. So for what I'll show you, we, we've used most of these, tried most of these, but just for the, this talk, I'll show you what happens with the symmetry functions. So these are functions that were originally introduced by Baylor. Um, and, and what they are is basically, as you can see in these expressions, these equations, they're basically pair and, and three body terms representing the environment. And so what you do is you, you here's a triplet of atoms, for example. Um, 
you first, you see the, the function on the top there is a pair function. It has two parameters, eta and rho. You choose two etas and rows. And then you compute this function for, this, uh, for each of these pairs, and that gives you a, a number that goes into the, into the list of descriptors. And that's the first descriptor. And then you do it again for a second atom and the third atom. Um, and then you just create more of these hyperparameters. And as you do that, you just get a long list of numbers that characterize all the bonds. And then you do the same thing for triple bonds, triple bodies, right? You take triplets of atoms, you choose hyperparameters. In this case, it's this zeta, lambda, eta. And for each selection of those three numbers, you get a number when you plug it in. So you can see where the fun comes in, is figuring out what, what is the good choice for these numbers, how many do I need, and that's where your time goes with a machine learning model. Okay, so we did that, and we trained this on uh, multi-layer graphene. Uh, I mean, these are the details, 51 descriptors, three hidden layers, 30 layers, uh, 30 nodes per layer. All of the, these numbers come from figuring out, doing grid searches and figuring out what gives you the best fit. There's no deep knowledge here. You're looking for your best performance. Then you create a huge training set. So in this case, the training set is 14,000 roughly DFT configurations that are computed. That's the set that the machine is trained on. Well, it, there's a test set and a training set, but most of this goes to training, and a small part is reserved for testing. Um, and we do our training set is all sorts of monolayer, bilayer, twisted, untwisted, defective, undefective. We just put a bunch of things in that we want to get right. Uh, I should say that an important part here is how do you deal with the um, uh, modeling the van der Waals interactions in the DFT because it's not captured by DFT. So you have to put in some kind of corrections, and there again, there are lots of different types of corrections, and we had to do some work to figure out which was the best one. And so this multi-body uh, dispersion correction turned out to be the uh, optimal one for us in terms of accuracy versus cost. And then we train it. And we did something a little bit different here than a regular uh, machine learning potential, kind of in the spirit of the descriptor. We know the van der Waals part of the interactions pretty well because that's, you can, essentially looks like Leonard Jones, although you can do better than that. And so we put that in analytically into our form. And then we only use the machine learning to correct off of the parts that we know analytically. So we call it a hybrid neural network. It's a mixture of these two things. So we first train the long range van der Waals part that we know analytically, and then once we have that, we go in and we do the neural network training. So that, that turned out to be very effective. Uh, and dealt with the, uh, with the fact that we have the separation of scales between the different types of bonding that are going on here. Okay, so here's some results from this thing. Um, what you're seeing here, this is the first set of results is the root mean square errors on the forces in the test set. So you have a bunch of configurations in the test set. We look at all the errors on all the forces and we see roughly what the error that we see are. And the errors you see are 0.045 uh, EV per angstrom. That's very small errors, that's quite good. Um, and they're compared to other potentials. So HNN is our potential gap, is a Gaussian approximation potential out of Gaborchani's group at Cambridge. It's a different type of machine learning potential. Um, the main difference is that gap never gets rid of its training set. So it uses the entire training set at every single evaluation, which slows it down, but gives it good accuracy. The neural network potential has far fewer parameters, and it once you've trained it, you throw away the training set, and it just uses the parameters. So it's a different idea, uh, but they're both uh, machine learning. And then all the other ones, Tursov, Rebo, et cetera, those are all bond order potentials. Those are physics-based potentials. And so you see they, the errors in the forces are significantly larger. H and N and gap are comparable in their performance. And these are other examples, lattice constants. You want to get the lattice constant of graphene right. So again, H and N and GRAP do the best. The other ones do you know, various levels of good. Um, uh, the elastic constant, not quite as great with H and N and GAP, but comparable to the best of the, uh, of the pair potentials, of the bond order potentials. Um, and, and there are a lot of other examples. I'll show you one more after this. But of course, we computed many, many different things. In all cases, it gave good results uh, for what we wanted. Uh, but there's a price for this. The price is the computation time. And so this is uh, the potentials on it versus a log time of calculation. And the calculation time is scaled versus Tursov, which is the cheapest of the bond order potentials. And so you see that our potential is about 280 times more expensive than Tursov. Uh, Reax, which is, was the reigning star, was 26 times fast, you know, slower than Tursov. 
But machine learning, you know, as I said, the descriptors are very expensive to compute, so that's a factor of 100. Uh, gap is about a factor of 100 slower than HNN. It's 1,000, 3,800 3, times slower than Tersoc. Uh, and as I said, that's because it has this big training set it carries around. Uh, but of course, you want to compare this to DFT. DFT is 10 million times slower than Tersoc. Okay, so these machine learning potentials give you accuracy comparable to DFT, but at you know much, much less cost. That's the way you should really think about it. Um, but of course, they're limited. The, the, this calculation time limits their usability. All right, so another example here, just to show you that what happens with the separation. So if you, in this case, I'm plotting the energy versus separation for the AA and AB stackings, and the dash, well, the lines are basically, um, well, okay, let me put it this way. The, the dots are DFT results, and you see that the DFT results live on different lines. The HNN potential all the way on the left picks that up, as does another potential called DRIP. This is, I'm, I'm not talking about that, but that's a physics-based potential that we developed for interlayer interactions in graphene, which actually does quite well. And so it picks this up as well, and it's phenomenally, you know, significantly faster than, uh, than HNN, but it only does interlayer. So you have to use it with something else like, you know, Rebo or LCBOP or something. And then LCBOP on the right, you see, doesn't, is not able to distinguish AA and AB stacking. The lines fall on the same, both of its results fall on the same line. And so it, it, it fails, basically. And in fact, all of the physics-based potentials that I showed in the previous page, they all fail. They all get the wrong behavior here. So that's a benefit of this. All right, so that just gives you a flavor of what developing a potential is like. But there's a problem with these machine learning potentials, and that's kind of what I want to talk about next. They have two big problems. I mean, one is that because they have so many parameters, there's always a danger of overfitting, right? So if you have a, a bunch of data and you just throw thousands of parameters at it, you may get the red line, where clearly the green line is the more correct fit to this data. And so overfitting is one traditional problem with machine learning. The other one is the lack of ability to extrapolate. And that's pr particularly troubling because you have a training set and as you move away from that training set, you have no physics, right? And so you begin to deviate and you can deviate very significantly very fast from the correct result. Um, it, it, it's even worse than this in the sense that because you live in such a high dimensional space, the picture of having some kind of a ball that you're moving away from is really not right because the training set is some super complicated form in high dimensional space and you can move through this and move a little bit and you're in a gap or a hole in your training set that you didn't realize. So this is a danger with, with machine learning. So we've developed a method to address that and we basically think that when you, whenever you're doing using machine learning for anything, but but for potential in this case, you should always have some kind of estimates on uncertainty so that you know whether you can trust a result or not. Without that, you really are, you'd like to live dangerously because uh, you really have no guarantees. So to do that, we use a method called dropout regularization. Yeah, regularization sorry. So that, that's a method that was developed uh, to prevent overfitting, the first problem I mentioned. And the way that it works is you take your neural network and as you're training the neural network, at every step of your training, you throw out some fraction of the connections. So let's say you have a whole bunch of connections in your neural network, right, the ones that are drawn there. And then at a particular step, you choose to throw away some fraction of them, say 10%. You throw them out randomly. Those are the ones that are dashed there. And then you do that constantly as you're training. So the result is you make your model a lot more robust against overtraining, right? Because it, can it can't really overtrain because you keep throwing away out its parameters. It effectively has less parameters. Um, and so that works well. And, and the way what you then do is after you've trained it, you use the entire network to evaluate. And so now you have a, a network that does a, a decent job of fitting. It's not the best possible because of this procedure, but it's less liable to overfit. So now what we do is different. We, we're using an idea that every one of those uh, situations where you drop some of the, of the connections is actually a realization of your model. It's, it's, you can think of all of those possibilities as an ensemble of models, right? Each one is a particular subset of the some set of possibilities that the model has. Um, and so, in fact, if you look at the second bullet, if there are two, if there are new nodes inside of your model, they're actually two to the power of new 
possible configurations that you have for the different ways you could throw out connections. And so that's the ensemble of models that you have. And so if you use that ensemble, you can make predictions on uncertainty. And in fact, Gall in Cambridge showed that you can actually mathematically uh, show that a, a dropout neural network is approximate to a Bayesian neural network. So you actually get, if you do the procedure I described, you get a Bayesian estimate of uncertainty. So the idea is very simple. What you do is if you want to evaluate some property, you evaluate it m times each time with a different dropout scenario. And that gives you m values for p, and you can compute the average in uncertainty. And so here's an example where we do that. We take a, a graphene bilayer, we stretch it, and we compute the stress inside of it. So that's the expression on the top. It's the virial, it's the potential part of the virial stress. Um, and so we compute that stress, and as we pull the sheet apart, the stress goes up. Uh, but now we compute the uncertainty as well. And so the line is what we get as the average value from our evaluation, and the error bar is the uncertainty itself. And so as you're stretching away from what the neural network potential was fit to, it begins to tell you, okay, I, I'm, I'm less and less certain of what's going on. It's capturing the uncertainty. And there's actually an interesting wrinkle here, probably too technical to really follow, but there are two ways you can do this evaluation. The first is the obvious one, which I just said. You do your simulation, you pull your graphene sheet to whatever level of strain, you run it for some amount of time, and you compute the stress. That's the, the time average that you see on top. And then I got one evaluation. Then I take another uh, realization of my model with a different dropout, do it again, get a second one, I do this you know, 100 times, which is what we did here, 100 times. So that means it's, it's very easy to do, but it's 100 times more expensive than a single simulation, right? Because that's what you have to do. The other way that you can do that is, is pretty neat. What you do is you run only a single simulation, and at every simulation, you, you're at a particular instant, a configuration, and what you do is you, you do 100 different force evaluations with different dropout values. And so then you can compute the uncertainty on the force and the uncertainty on the energy. You propagate your system forward versus using the average force. And, and then you propagate the uncertainty from step to step to the end to the uncertainty of the stress. And you need to, the issue is you need to reformulate your problem. You have to really think of it as this kind of, you, you can rewrite the problem uh, sigma as depending on all of these steps along the way, and then you can formally write down how to propagate the uncertainty. If you do that, you get exactly the same result. Now you think, okay, this is not any faster, because you're doing 100 evaluations at each step versus 100, you know, doing it, it it's linear, right? So what, why should it make a difference? Anybody know why, why does it make a difference? This is way faster. No idea? So the issue is that the, the, remember, the bottleneck is the calculation of the descriptor, right? So the descriptor in the second method only has to be computed once. You compute the descriptor for an atom, and then you do 100 force evaluations with different neural networks, which is almost free, okay? So much, much, much faster that way. So we're kind of, we, we, we think that this is a good way to do it. So you, in essence, you get uncertainty with almost no additional cost, maybe a factor of two, something like that. Okay, so all of this is implemented in a package uh, we call CLIF for Kim-based learning integrated fitting framework. It's a Python-based framework. It's integrated with PyTorch and TensorFlow, which are machine learning packages, one from Google and one is just a package out there. Um, it's got built-in information theory and uncertainty quantification tools. Multiple descriptors are in there. It's open source. We put really good documentation online. And we try to bake in as much of what we learned in the process of fitting these potentials to take away some of the pain of doing that. Uh, and we could, we're continuing to work on that package. So if you're interested in using that, you're invited to use it or contact us if you want more information. It's open source and, and uh, usable. Now, it's got K, the K in the name is Kim. I, I'll just briefly mention that ties into another project I'm involved in, which is a big infrastructure for archiving potentials learning about them, testing them, integrating them into codes like LAMPS and DL Poly and Gulp and so on. So I, I'm not going to talk about that here, but if you're interested in where that is, and in fact, we've made major advances in the last few months, uh, if you want to know about what's going on there, I'm giving a talk tomorrow at 4.30, so you're welcome to, to come. Okay, so that's like part one. That gives you the idea of how you develop potentials for these systems. So now we have a model, we have good potentials, what do we do with it? 
So the next part is that we want to simulate the mechanics of these systems. And uh, okay. And so here what we want to do is we want to simulate these stacked uh, graphene multilayers uh, or multilayer graphene, and we want to understand their behavior. And we developed a method to do that. I won't say too much about it except to say that what we do is we basically take two-dimensional plate finite element methods, and in fact, it's appropriate that Michael is here because we use the subdivision finite element method that came out of his group, which is a beautiful method. If you don't know about it, you should talk to Michael. It basically takes ideas from, from graphics, right, from uh, visualization, the way they make cartoons and, you know, all these, uh, what, what are those things called? Um, I forget the name. Anyway, they're all they're these graphic animations, and they use that for finite element interpolation. So it's a pretty neat method. We use it because it gives us a C1 conforming plate method. And so every finite element layer is one of these finite element ma models. And then they, there's, they interact with e each other through uh, Van der Waals interaction. And so we basically integrate the Van der Waals interaction between the layers, and so they're coupled in this way. Uh, and the details are in the coupling, as usual. I won't go into this because I'm running late a little bit, but there's a way how we compute the the Van der Waals interaction is basically by integrating it across the layers, and so we evaluated the Gauss points, and then we use an appropriate interlayer model for, uh, for that, including this drip model that I mentioned before. Okay, so we come back to this problem. We wanted to understand this problem. So what, where, where is this pattern coming from, these uh, triangular patterns? So the origin is, this is where the title of the talk is, this moiré business. Uh, it comes from a moiré pattern that's formed when you twist the two layers. So if, if you look at now, you're seeing two layers of graphene on top of each other in AA stacking. And if I begin to rotate, so this is three degrees, six degrees, this is, you're seeing an interference pattern between the top and the bottom. That's the moiré pattern. And the moiré pattern, notice if I go back, the moiré pattern gets, there are these, these islands that form, right? Can you see them? Sort of regions of, 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 uh, where it's commensurate, the distance between these, if you look closely, gets smaller the bigger the rotation, okay? And so this is well understood, the geometry of moiré patterns. The spacing between them, it, it, this is a regular pattern, it's periodic, the, uh, the, um, or I should say quasi-periodic, because the moiré pattern is periodic, perfectly periodic, but the arrangements of the atoms within each moiré cell is not periodic, but close to periodic. Um, so anyway, the spacing between the moiré uh, cells, sometimes called moirons, uh, is you, you know it from geometry. And if you look at the pattern, more interesting for me right now is that you can identify three types of, of domains. There is an AA stacking domain where these things are perfectly commensurate. There is an AB stacking domain where they just happen to fall in the AB orientation. And then an, something called an SP stacking, which is a different stacking. So these repeat throughout the pattern. Okay, so now if you take two layers and you rotate them by some amount, in this case about two degrees, the pattern on the left is what you get if you plot the energy before you allow for any relaxation in the system. And you, you see that that's the, the AA is high energy, AB is low energy, and then these SP are intermediate energy between the two of them. That pattern is just formed by the rotation, the one on the left. When you allow the system to relax, it creates the pattern on the right. And that's coming from our model when we do the relaxation. You see that the AB and BA domains grow because they're the low energy domains, so they're growing at the expense of SP. Uh, but mainly the effect is that the AA domains shrink. They're trying to get as little as possible because that's high energy, okay? Of course, you can't completely get rid of the AA because of the pattern that you started with. It's kind of baked in because of the, of the structure. So this is basically the pattern that you see in that uh, dark field image that you saw before. That's the black and gray triangles. Now, since we also have access to exactly what's going on in the mechanics, we understand also the mechanism here. And the mechanism is interesting. It's a twisting mechanism. So the AA domains in the middle, they kind of rotate and shrink. They kind of do something like this. They rotate and shrink inside of the model, and the AAB domains rotate a little bit, not as much, but they rotate a little bit in the other direction and form these triangles. Um, interestingly, out-of-plane motion almost plays no role. You would think that these things would try and bend in order to get rid of it. That's not what's happening. It's primarily a rotation and shearing inside of the graphene, which was surprising to me. So then we said, okay, well, it, 
you know, this, we understand the rotation mechanism, but ha what happens if we rotate by different amounts? How does that affect the amount of extra rotation that takes place? So that's the plot over here. It shows the final rotation I at the AA domains as a function of the initial rotation that you put between the two graphene layers. And you see this sort of two domain type of behavior. Below about one degree, it's uniform. Above one degree, it begins to, by uniform, I mean constant, so the final rotation is constant. Below that, it just rotates, there is no extra rotation, because the AA rotation is whatever you fed it initially with when you rotated the layers. So below one degree, there is additional rotation that takes place that is reducing the size. And so we saw that, it was a little surprising. Note also that one degree just happens to be where superconductivity was discovered. It's not so unusual. It's happening because exactly because of this restructuring that's going on here. And so what's going on is, it's okay, so we were puzzled by this initially, but like everything in retrospect is obvious, right? So at the small angles, you have, you have a behavior that looks like this. Here's the moiré pattern. But now the, these distances are very large from each other. What's essentially happening is that each AA domain is independent of the other ones. It's, each of these are rotating without really feeling the other ones, and so you get uniform rotation. There's no, more, they, they no, there's no longer interaction between them. Whereas over here, it's actually acting as a single unit, and there's, even, there's no capacity to rotate at all, and so there is no additional rotation. So I'm kind of running late, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll skip the details, but we developed a mechanical model to explain this. We did some linear elasticity and also an energetic model. And simply by characterizing the different energetics of what's going on, we're able to come up with an analytical expression for that uniform rotation angle at the end. And what the, the bottom line is that it's, it's this uh, square root, 8 pi, whatever, and it's the ratio of the energy penalty for those stacking um, saddle point domains, the layers between the AB and BA, there's an energy cost, and the shear modulus of the graphene. Those are the two things that set the angle at which things rotate. And so like things like superconductivity, those are the parameters that play a role here. So then the last thing I'll show you is we wanted to validate all of this. So we were pretty excited. We saw these domains and we ran to our experimental colleagues at Harvard, Philip Kim, and we said, we want you to do high resolution TEM of, of our, uh, <laughs> of our uh, things, you know, of our domains here, these, these sorts of structures, oops, these, stru these kind of structures that you're seeing here and see if what we see is correct. So he, he said, okay, I can't do that. Uh, and that's because when you do, sorry, when you do a rotation, they actually have these capping layers that make it impossible to do TEM. So what they can do is electron diffraction. And so then we went back and we looked at electron diffraction. The images on the bottom is what was available in the literature before this. And you see, uh, if you're familiar with electron diffraction, you'll understand these. You see these Bragg peaks, and they, there are six of them. And that's because of the six-fold symmetry of graphene. But they're split into two points each. And that's because you've got two layers of graphene. So it's kind of what you would expect. We did it. We found something a little bit different. So the, the panels on the top is what we get when we did simulated electron diffraction on our system. And you see that uh, in the unrelaxed state, indeed, we see six Bragg peaks of two spots each, just like you see in those experimental images. But when we allowed our system to relax, we found that at the low angles, which co correspond to that Cayenne region where things are constant, um, we get these complicated diffraction patterns. Can you see how it's turned from two spots into like a cluster of spots, little satellite spots? And so we saw this, we showed this to Philip. Initially, he didn't believe us. He thought that, well, it's an artifact or, you know, we said we don't have artifacts because it's a, it's a simulation. So it's not, you know, he was thinking experimental artifact. And so then, um, then they developed basically a technique to be able to do this in their lab. Very tricky to be able to twist something to, you know, sub degrees accurately and hold it. And so they developed that. And so then we took our, our results and we compared it to their experiments. And this is the comparison. And so this was pretty exciting. You know, we, we basically, it's quali quantitative, no, qualitatively looks almost identical to the patterns that they're seeing in the experiments. We then said, okay, but is it quanti quantitatively uh, an agreement? And the agreement, again, is almost perfect. The, the spots are the experiments from Kim's group. The lines are the theoretical calculations in our system. So we have very, very good agreement. 
So then the question was, okay, well, what is causing this? And our postulate was that this is the twisting that's going on at the AA domains. And so to validate that, we, we found that the, that expression on the top captures the kinematics of that rotation almost perfectly. We call this Gaussian rotation. If, if you take the center of the AA domains and you superpose this kinematics, simply rotate everything with an amplitude that decays exponentially with distance from the center of the AA domain. If you do that, you get the, uh, re the energy on the left, the exact simulation results are on the right, so we're missing some of the SP details and so on, which is not surprising. But if you look at the electron diffraction, the two are almost identical. So that basically means that this rotation that's taking place is really what's driving that, that uh, electron diffraction pattern. I'm done. And so Michael scared me, so I'm moving to the summary slide. So I'll stop there and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.